There was no house to house investigation, ladies and gentlemen. Do you remember Judge Brown on the stand saying that this was the most efficient, deficient investigation, criminal investigation, he had ever seen as a criminal court judge? And he's talking about all of these kinds of things. Imagine, no house to house investigation. What that means is, no policeman going and knocking on the door of all of the local residents and asking them, did they see anything? Did they hear anything? Because surely if they had, they would have knocked on Olivia Pinkling's door, wouldn't they? She just lived down the street on Mulberry. And she would have told them what she saw, but they didn't. They didn't do that, did they? No, they didn't do that. Not at all. Why? Why did they suppress two alibi statements? A statement from Ray Hendricks and William Reed, who left Jim's Grill all oh, 35 minutes past the hour of 5, 40 minutes past the hour of 5, right around there, maybe even, maybe even uh, well, right around that time. It's been difficult to pin the exact time stamp, but they left Jim's Grill, saw them saw James O'Reilly's Mustang parked in front of the grill, commented on it for a few minutes, and then started to walk up the street. And a few minutes later, they had gone up a couple of blocks and were just about to cross Vance, one pulled the other back as the same white Mustang, so they thought it came right around the corner, driving away. As James O'Reilly had said he'd done. He'd always said he left the scene of the crime around that time to try to go have a spare tire repair. <coughs> And here are two alibi witnesses with statements given to the FBI in their 302s, kept from the defense, withheld from the guilty plea jury, suppressed. What else was suppressed? What was suppressed was the, the fact that they had a, a scientific report from the FBI that the, the dent in the windowsill did not have, could not sufficiently be tied to the rifle. They had that. They had that almost a year prior to the actual guilty plea hearing. And yet they went before the guilty plea jury and said <coughs> that scientific evidence would establish that the murder weapon made that dent. Obstruction of justice? Suppression? That and worse. What about the death slug that was of known that could not be matched? You know, the media and the state have turned the burden, in this case, of, of matching the bullet to the, to the rifle the other way around. They're saying, because you can't exclude it, it may be the murder weapon. That's not the way it works. In any other case, that's not the way it works. This is not a good rifle in evidence when you cannot match the death slug to it. And it was a death slug capable of being matched. You have evidence that, that that bullet was capable of being matched if it could. There were enough, enough striations, enough independent markings that they could match it if, if they could. So the guilty plea hearing heard jury, heard none of this. I talked to members of the guilty plea jury, uh, jury years later. They heard none of this. This was all kept. They certainly would have had questions about Mr. Ray's plea if they had. They certainly didn't know that his lawyer uh, had agreed in writing to pay $500 if he would plead guilty and not cause any problems, and that $500 would be used to hire another lawyer who could help overturn the plea. They certainly were not told of that. They certainly were not told of those kinds of pressures that descended on him at the last minute to cop this plea, which I'm, I'm afraid people do all the time in desperation, particularly when they're in isolation, the way he was. And what about Captain Whedon? Why couldn't he? Captain of the fire station, never interviewed by local police authorities. The man who ran that installation, who was there at the time, never interviewed by the president. Forgetting about knocking on people's doors. Here's, a, here's an official. He's a senior executive officer of the fire station. They didn't talk to him. They didn't interview him. They didn't ask him what was going on there that afternoon. 
Were they afraid that he would have told them about the photographers on the roof? Because if he had, then they would have been on notice, wouldn't they? They would have been on notice that there are photographs of what went on. And they would have then had to request those photographs. So if you don't talk to Captain Wheaton, you don't have to know about it. You don't know about it, you don't ask for it. You heard uh, Bill Schaff on the stand for a long time talking about media distortion and the use of media for propaganda. And he gave you the history of how it's developed over, particularly over 20th century America, but it's, of course it's a long-standing activity in, uh, th throughout history in older nations than this. But Schaap took you painstakingly through that history down to the present time where he dealt with the way the media handled Martin Luther King, how he ha handled his opposition to the war in Vietnam, how he was attacked because of that opposition to the war. And then it moved, he moved on, and this, this similar, comparable attacks on the King family uh, since they decided that they wanted the truth out in this case, and they decided that James Earl Ray was entitled to a trial. Similar, similar media treatment happened to them happened to Martin. Similar loss of contributions and money for the work that happened to Martin back in those days. <coughs> Same thing Phil Schaap led you through that. There were a couple of uh, uh, instances where he referred to the human <coughs> ownership and control of media entities all over the world by the, the Central Intelligence Agency. It's a matter of public records appeared in congressional hearings, Senate hearings, which most people don't read, don't know anything about. Of course, the media only covers in, in sparse fashion because it's, it's contrary to their interest to show that great numbers of newspapers, radio stations, television stations may in fact be actually owned by the Central Intelligence Agency in this country as well as elsewhere. He talked about the numbers of actual agents who work for media companies who are placed in positions in network television company positions, in newspaper company positions, on newspaper editorial board positions. And if you see the history of how national security cases are covered, and this is one, you will be amazed that some of the most liberal columnists, writers, respected journalists, Pulitzer Prize winners, who have all the liberal credentials, when it comes to this kind of case, they all of a sudden, totally with the government, because national security cases are a different ballgame. Ambassador Young ran into one at one point in an airport and said to him, how can you do this, Tony, about this case? You have great credentials in every other way. What, what is it about this case? And his response was, you'd be happy to know my wife agrees with but that was it. That was the end of the response. The point is, on these cases, there is a special type of treatment that is given. It's important to understand that across the board, and that explains a lot of what we're talking about. Examples, <clears throat> column one, New York Times, November. The article is here. Um, Alton, Illinois, bank robbery. Wendell Walls, Jr., the Times wrote this whole piece, fabric whole cloth. That the Ray brothers robbed the bank in Illinois and that's where James got his money and therefore there's no row. The problem was that the article said that the Times had conducted a special investigation that paralleled that of the House Select Committee and that of the House, uh, House Select Committee and that of the FBI. And all three investigations indicated this was the case. Case closed. This is where Ray got his money. Problem is they never talked to the chief of police in Oklahoma. They never talked to the president of the bank in Oklahoma. There was no investigation. And when those people were talked to by myself or by Jerry Ray, who went down there, turned himself in, said, I'm charged. You think, you think I did this? I'm prepared to turn myself in. And I said, no way. You've never been a suspect. Isn't that amazing? Out of a whole cloth. But it appears, and that's the mindset that the people have. 